Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about predictions for Season 2 of The Living World, as well as basically recap of everything that happened in Season 1 of The Living World. We've just come out of Season 1, the big finale happened, we've also just had the feature patch, so now everybody's looking to what arena net put in the game next, and of course that's going to be Season 2. A lot happened in Season 1, it spanned a really long period of time, they didn't even know they were going to do seasons at first, and so there's a lot of things that could be returning, like seasonal events, as well as the setups they've given us in terms of the next dragon we're going to fight and characters. So I'm going to take you through step by step and plunge myself in the deep end. I'm going to force myself to make a prediction about what will happen in Season 2 and we will see how many or just how few of these actually end up coming true. And I'll try and give reasons for each of my predictions about where I see the story going. If I'm really clueless then I'll just say something absurd. Super Adventure Box I think it's pretty safe to say that the Super Adventure Box will be coming back in Season 2 of The Living World. There were some weird rumours going around that perhaps the devs weren't working on it, but there have been forum posts even up to quite recently with devs stating they are working on it. The question is going to be what's going to be there in the third update. Gameplay wise, of course, I think we'll be getting our World 3. I think they're probably going to make the levels shorter, though perhaps add more levels to compensate. One of the biggest complaints about World 2 was it was very difficult and this was compounded by the fact the levels were so long. If they just split the levels into two chunks apiece, so it was like you had two ninja themed levels instead of just one super long one, I think people would have been a lot more happy with it and that's probably some feedback the devs will have taken on board. But what about the story? The first Super Adventure Box release had really very little lore. It was mostly tied in with the cool April Fool's joke. But the second update added a lot of really ominous stuff, and this is quite high on my list of things I'm most interested about. You see, much of the speculation last year when these ominous facts came out, people were tying to Scarlet. Now Scarlet's gone and we know she had nothing to do with them, so it's been blown wide open. The backstory is that the man who made the Super Adventure Box, an Asura named Motto, was once in another crew. He made the Super Adventure Box on his own, but before he made it, he's in another crew with a bunch of other Asura. He was kicked out of that crew for somewhat mysterious circumstances. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that bears ill will towards people, but he pulled a supposedly a nasty prank on his crewmates, and that's what got him kicked out. What they were working on originally was something called just the Adventure Box, which they called an edutainment device. Sounds very similar to the Super Adventure Box. But as soon as Motto was kicked out and left the project, the original Adventure Box had been stalled and then eventually cancelled. Meanwhile, while his previous crewmates were suffering, Motto was having a lot of mysterious good fortune. He approached an investor to give him money so he could produce the damn thing, but failed to get it into a really good working state. We had a whole story on this, a blog post that the devs put up online, where you learned that he was working really hard, but even up until the final day before this investor was going to come, not everything was finished. He passes out the work incomplete and wakes up to the investor knocking on his door. The investor comes in and shockingly when Motto turns the device on, it's working in perfect order. It isn't just working in perfect order, it's got features and things in it Motto has no memory of ever programming in. There's a really cool passage from the end of this particular story, it's called The Shadow Box, which I read to you now that really gets you thinking what the hell is going on here, uh, about the very end of this moment, when Motto is showing the super adventure box to his investor, and he sees a woman in the distance. Listen to this. It says, In the distance, a beautiful blonde girl appeared. She gave Motto an energetic wave. He didn't think he had polished the characters, but the princess model was done, and more she reminded Motto of her. The princess smiled and waved to Motto. Motto lifted his hand to wave back, but froze when he spotted an ominous shadow in the shape of himself behind her. Motto blinked, and the shadow was gone. That's how the story ends. What could this mean? Again, everybody thought it was going to be to do with Scarlet, and even there the speculation couldn't go very far. Like, what would the link have been? Oh, Scarlet can teleport around and do weird stuff with technology. There's another facet to this puzzle too. At the end of the second update for the Super Adventure Box, if you completed everything, you could enter a cave with a mysterious genie in it who told you in a cryptic way to sabotage the old crewmates of Motto. Uh, who are working on a new device called the Somno Scholar, which you as a player can do. Who is this genie? When you talk to Motto about it, again, he seems completely oblivious. 
genies in this game, as far as I'm aware, are supposed to be the same as Jin, and Jin are creatures from Elona, elemental creatures that can transform to look like anything they wish, but even that doesn't offer us much explanation into what the heck is going on with this story, and I really think this will be expanded on in an interesting way next time. Do consider as well that Motto's competition could eventually bring out a game of their own, and things may get even more complicated from there. The Zephyrite Sanctum. So, the Sanctum wasn't the biggest of arcs in Season 1 of Living World. It was at the point where, on my channel, you can see me saying, Oh, Living World sucks, it feels like a bunch of filler. However, for a filler story within Season 1, it was done very well and it touched on some really cool old lore from the first game many people were excited to see. It even led the community to believe they may be going to the Crystal Desert soon, which never ended up happening. This update introduced us to a group of people called the Zephyrites, who are sky merchants. They live on a giant floating airship, uh, and they travel the world trading black market goods um, in an illegal event they host called the Bazaar of the Four Winds. This illegal event is frowned upon by people like the Seraph, who actively tried to close it down. However, last year they returned to Tyria for the first time in a long, long time, and Lion's Arch, being a town of pirates and cutthroats, decided they wanted to take advantage of it. In fact, they tried to open up a trade agreement with the Sky Pirates, and in succeeding doing so, this should in theory mean that the Zephyrites return to Tyria more frequently. This was accompanied by a plot of an election within Lion's Arch. Whoever secured the trade agreement, Evan Nashblade or Ellen Keel, would become the new Captain Council member, and we as a community helped Ellen Keel do the job. So before Lion's Arch was destroyed, it seemed quite fair to believe that the Zephyrite Sanctum would return as they now have a trade agreement with the people in Lion's Arch. But everyone there is now dead or destroyed or gone. There is no Lion's Arch and the other capitals within Tyria didn't seem interested in the first place in dealing with these Sky Merchants. So my prediction is that the Zephyrite Sanctum will not return for Season 2. As great of a release it was, as much as I enjoyed the Bazaar of the Four Winds, what it did for the economy in the game, how it incorporated all the jumping puzzle stuff, and a bunch of cool mini-games, I do not predict it will return. I also started this little segment by telling you it felt like a filler arc, and I don't think that Season 2 will have much filler. I think that the devs know much clearer where they're going this time, and they know that filler can damage them in a big way, so I don't think the Zephyrite Sanctum is coming back. There was some other cool lore with the Zephyrite Sanctum involving Glint and the Dwarven Brotherhood, how basically they are the successors to a group of dwarves who looked after Glint, who herself was the champion of one of the Elder Dragons still at large, Kraukatorik. But I don't think that's going to have any relevance to Season 2 of the story. Kraukatorik in particular is not the dragon we're currently going for. And maybe, in fact, I'll make a really long-term prediction here, the Zephyrite Sanctum will not return until Kraukatorik is under our crosshair. Queen's Jubilee. Last year was the 10th year of Queen Jenna of Humanity's reign. Um, so a big celebration was held by her in Divinity's Reach, and it was very much there to show that humanity was indomitable and they still had strength and they weren't being pushed back. One of the biggest things about the update was they renovated one of the districts in Divinity's Reach that had recently collapsed, the Great Collapse, and had a lot of mystery around it, but I guess was just hushed-hushed and moved along, and they basically made an entirely new area where humanity could go in a big arena and participate in combat. Combat against mankind's key enemies, the center the bandits, and so forth. As well as renovating that district, they also unveiled humanity's latest foray into technology, a large number of mechanized creatures named the Watchwork Knights. We still need backstory on where these knights came from. Turns out Scarlet Briar had sabotaged them and during the celebrations used them to wreak havoc within Divinity's Reach. We got a little bit more backstory on this when the Tower of Nightmares arc came out, but it's still not fully clear. What does any of this mean for next year though? I think very little again. Don't forget this celebration was only held because it was her 10th year as Monarch. I do believe this event will return, but I think mostly because ArenaNet wants to open up the gameplay opportunities of the Gauntlet and the Crown Pavilion again. I don't think that this is going to be a massive, massive affair, because really it was only supposed to have been big in lore because it was her 10th year. I think they'll have a bit of a celebration, but most story this year when the Queen's Jubilee returns, which I predict it will, will be to do with character-specific things. I believe Marjorie Delacroix, 
Her sister, Lady Kazmir, and perhaps even her family will have a big role to play. Last year, we also had a bit of drama between Anise and Logan. Anise basically slapping Logan down, saying that he wasn't fit to be in the position he was in. And I personally would love to see more of that, so I'm going to bang that in with the speculation there too. I think another key thing we'll see for this update next year is the conclusion to this weird little story we've got, it, got going on with Hobotron and the Minstrel. These two characters are comic relief characters, basically, that are being blamed by the people of Divinity's Reach for the destruction that went down that year, even though they're not really bad guys. Even up until the most recent update, we saw they were still being hounded, and uh, the little robot, at least, is trying to prove, hey, I'm a good guy, I'm not in favour of Scarlet Briar, to the point where he was running around trying to resurrect us in the final fight. I think that this story will come to a conclusion, and at last they'll say, aha, no, you are fine, and um, you are free to go on your way. Either that, or they'll actually imprison Hobotron, and there might be something that comes out of that. But he'll be involved, I'm sure of that much. Lion's Arch. During the event of Season 1, Lion's Arch was completely destroyed. This happened just before the finale. Scarlet Briar attacked it with all of her might. Turns out it was built over a connection of a bunch of ley lines beneath the surface, and Scarlet needed to use her giant drill right there to awaken Morgimoth. So now we have a ruined city that was once the melting pot of every single player in Guild Wars 2. Do I think that they will touch it in Season 2? My prediction? They won't. I think they're actually going to leave Lion's Arch as it is and let it to sit there and stew. Now, it might seem they have very good reason to rebuild Lion's Arch since so many of their festivals like Halloween, Dragon Bash and Winter's Day are all featured here and they did want to be able to reuse that stuff, but I think they may have gone back on that now. I think that for this arc to have had impact, they need to leave Lion's Arch destroyed for a while to let all those players over the next year, even perhaps six months definitely, trickle back into the game and see that things have really changed. Yes, when Lion's Arch is rebuilt, which I believe it will be, it will probably look different, but I don't think it can happen too soon. I think they're going to let it marinate for a while. And I believe one of the other big reasons why this won't be touched is they have stated, and again, they may go back on this, but they have stated that there won't be any choices or currently there are no choices planned for season two of The Living World. Choices like how we chose Ed and Keel instead of Evan Nashblade. Because of this, Lion's Arch would be like the greatest candidate for something to give the community choices on. How do you want to rebuild this place? Look, let people vote on the position of buildings and so forth. That would be really interesting and something I think that they might like to tap into. But given that they don't have any plans right now, I think that rebuilding LA will be on the back burner and its destruction will be a catalyst for change in other updates like Halloween and like Winter's Day. And I think that's something that's going to excite people and be something good for the game rather than rebuilding it too quickly. Like the idea of, oh, Lion's Arch is destroyed, so we'll host Halloween in the Black Citadel now. And everything changes from then on. Dessa and the Fractals. Now, I told you guys at the start of this video, I really enjoy Motto's story with the Super Adventure Box. I think Dessa's may be more interesting. It's at least just as messed up or even more messed up. And hey, these are both Asuran stories. What do you know? Dessa is the Asura in charge of the Fractals project. She is maintaining the Mistlock Observatory. This is the place you zone into when you run into Fractals of the Mists. And she lives there. She lives in the Mists, exploring fragments of past realities and helping you as a player to navigate them as well and get your rewards. The thing with Dessa is that as someone living in the mist, in these weird shards that are constantly cycling over and over, she herself seems to have a lot of odd things about her. She herself seems to be a contradiction. For example, number one, when the Fractals first opened up, they were opened as a consortium tourist attraction. Here on reality side, on the Terrier side of things, that's what the consortium doing. They were opening this link up. However, when we go inside and we see Dessa, who basically created the entire thing, she seems to despise the consortium, wants nothing to do with them. There was a bit of a story about how she'd lost her boyfriend to them once, but she hates them. So how can it be that they collaborated to open up the Fractals of the Mist project and let the players in in the first first place. Even weirder than that, she has a bunch of friends who worked at the Thormanova reactor, which blew up in a catastrophe two years ago now, I guess, from the current timeline, maybe three, and yet she has no idea that the destruction ever happened. 
That may be somewhat excusable if she's just been working very hard in her lab for a long time, but she doesn't seem to appreciate that the Silvari are a race at all. If you speak to her as a Silvari, she says, oh, you're very curious, what the hell are you? That would suggest she hasn't left her lab in over 25 years, and that sort of contradicts what we just heard about how she has friends at the Thormanova reactor and had a boyfriend with a consortium and seemed to have a life outside of the fractals at least 10 years ago. 25 years is a long time. In the most recent update to the Fractals of the Mist, we had a very curious scene in which Ellen Keel, after learning what's happened at the Thormanova reactor with Dessa, tries to get Dessa to leave the Mistlock Observatory. Ellen Keel does not want this in consortium hands, essentially, even though it kind of isn't. Again, more contradictions. She tries to take Dessa out of the Mistlock Observatory, but as soon as she is taken out, Dessa just wanders back in as if nothing has ever happened. She just reappears with no memory she's ever spoken to Ellen Keel at all, and things continue as they all always were. This sort of suggests that the lab, the Mistlock Observatory, is a fractal just as much as the fractals we travel to as players. My prediction is that at some point in Season 2 of The Living World, we will get another update to Fractals. This is not really for lore reasons, this is because I believe they'll add more instabilities, allow us to climb higher, give people more incentives to go for the higher agony resist infusions. And with that, I predict, just because it's the thing to do, right, that we'll get one more new Fractal, and that new Fractal will be on Dessa's backstory. If I'm maybe a little bit less conservative, perhaps two new fractals. One that's really interesting about some past Guild Wars lore thing. Let's take a leap here and say it's going to be a Canthan-based fractal. And one more explaining a bit more of Dessa's backstory. Because there's a lot of weird stuff in many of those, like where she says, Oh, I've got to go, and there's the crazy cat lady fractal, and so forth. Zaitan. This is something very small, but I do want to touch on it. Last year, the living story explicitly stated to us that in the lore, Tequattle, one of Zaitan's biggest champions, had grown in strength. They told us that he'd grown in strength. They didn't have to do that. When they updated him, renovated the mechanics, and gave, up, gave us our first mega boss, they could have just let it, uh, left it as a purely mechanical thing, but they did not do that. Why did they tell us that the champion of a now deceased elder dragon is growing in strength a year later? This could mean two things. Number one, they now regret doing it and they'll pass it off as some kind of link to Mordremoth. Oh, it's just that the ley lines were being disturbed in some way and now he, he grew stronger. It's nothing to do with Zaitan. Or two, they are somewhere long term setting up something of a filler release where we return to Zaitan and uh, they actually revamp the atrocious end of their personal story. The big black mark on Guild Wars 2 for any new player that comes in the game is the end of the personal story. It has been there, it could have been fixed for a long time now, we're coming up to two years since launch. It's something they have to do eventually, and my prediction is that this is why they told us that, that Tequata was getting stronger, so that eventually they could tie it back into that. How will they do it? Will they say that Zaitan was alive all along? Or will they simply revamp the whole thing, a raw story mode, and give us a completely different experience? I think they'll revamp the whole thing and shoehorn in the Tequata line somehow, but it's something that will happen. Do I predict it will be in Season 2? No. I think it would be smartest in Season 2. I think they need to get the Zaitan stuff out of the way of before they go deeper into the Mordremoth line. Otherwise, it's like, oh, we're killing two Elder Dragons at once. What's going on? This is kind of weird. But I don't think they'll do it. I think this will be something for far further down the road. And this weird bit of lore they gave us in Season 1 will not be touched. The Tengu. Oh, Tengu, Tengu, Tengu. Everybody calls for them. Everybody wants them. Will they come with this season? There are many reasons, logically, why ArenaNet would give us the Tengu. The Tengu have been the biggest candidate for a playable race. They've got to the point where the core systems in their game are sound, and people are going to be looking for new races, new weapons to their classes, new classes of utility skills. This is the point where the base game is strong enough for them to start implementing these kind of things. But is it the right move for them to implement it as a part of Living World? How do they handle Living World releases in terms of their scope? Can they give us the Tengu? Are they going to try and force Tengu in on one of these essentially quite small updates. I don't think they will. The idea of getting an entirely new playable race would suggest we get a whole new personal story to go with it, as well as the complementing new maps perhaps to explore and city. 
because of the scope of the update, I am hesitant to say it will come in Season 2. Lore-wise, is there any more reason why we would get Tengu in Season 2 than we did in Season 1? No, really. What's our biggest reason? Proximity. It's very likely that Season 2 stuff is going to take us into the Maguma jungle. That's pretty basic. And, of course, the Dominion of Winds is adjacent to Caladon Forest. But I don't think this is reason enough to go to the Tengu lore-wise. The Tengu lore-wise seem to be ha having problems with destroyers more than anything else. And again, this is not the dragon we are facing. I think when we eventually get Tengu, it will be some kind of tie into a potential move down to Cantha. And that is not something we'll be seeing with Season 2 of Living World. Unless these updates come adjacent to it. So we have Living World and other big projects going on at once. But uh, so far, no word on that happening. And I may eat my words on this one. People may look back and laugh and say, oh, we did get Tengu. And that will be a happy surprise to me very much. Dragon Bash. Let's look at Dragon Bash because this is probably the most interesting festival. I've already said what I think about Winter's Day and Halloween, how they'll probably be hosted in other cities. Because I do not believe that Lion's Arch will be fully restored in time for them to come out. What about Dragon Bash? Dragon Bash was a festival about essentially laughing at the idea of other Elder Dragons. They've been in the background for a long time and this is sort of Tyria's way of... Um, consoling themselves over them, not living in fear all the time. And uh, there was a lot of controversy in-game in the universe. There was a lot of controversy about Dragon Bash. Many people thought it was foolish to mock the Elder Dragons. And I find it very cool that if you look in retrospect at all of Season 1, when Scarlet made one of her first big moves where she assassinated a member on the Captain's Council and revealed her hand, the Aether Blades, and made a real attack, a real step towards Lion's Arch. When Scarlet first did this, in the name of an Elder Dragon, it was during a festival where all these people were mocking the Elder Dragon. So does Dragon's Bash come back this year? If you read the official lore about what Dragon Bash is, I'll give it to you guys right now. Lion's Arch honours the defiant spirit of its citizenry with the rousing Dragon Bash festival, when revellers laugh in the face of fear. Sponsored by the Captain's Council of Lion's Arch. Dragon Bash is a monthly long celebration, blah blah blah. Sponsored by the Captain's Council. The Captain's Council aren't there anymore, there is no Lion's Arch. So who's going to sponsor Dragon Bash this year? Considering many didn't appreciate it much the first time, and considering that the very people who were mocking the Elder Dragons uh, have now just been destroyed in the name of awakening a new one. This could go in any direction. My prediction, therefore, will be based on what I most want to see, and that is that Dragon Bash will return, that it will be hosted by the Norn, who still have that kind of upbeat, ah ha ha, we laugh at adversity spirit, and I'm going to make a pretty bold statement here, I believe that Season 2 of The Living World will begin with the Dragon Bash Festival. Think about it, last year Dragon Bash began in early June. We are just now moving into May. That would put Season 2 of Living World beginning a month from now. Some of you may feel that a month is a, quite a while to wait, but think about how long we had to wait for the final four releases over that Christmas period. If they waited a month before giving us Season 2 of The Living World and began it on Dragon Bash, which is really quite a nice symmetry there. We're beginning a whole season about fighting an Elder Dragon and we're beginning with a festival laughing at them. I think it works very well. I think that that is exactly what will happen. We will have Dragon Bash hosted in another city and that will be the start of the season. We may have a smaller update before there. Like I feel like Super Adventure Box would slot in really nicely just before the season begins fully, but they may not do that as well. But that's how I think it will begin, with Dragon Bash and it won't be in Lion's Arch. Mordremoth. That's it really for all of the returning style events, you know, the filler arcs, I suppose, or specific things you can pick out from last year. What about the general direction of Season 2? I can tell you guys, I think very early on, we'll be having updates centred around the Brisbane Wildlands. They have already set up that Marjorie Delacroix's sister, Belinda, is headed out there. It was like one of the biggest red flags I've ever seen for a character that could potentially die I believe the Seraph that are out there investigating things will m go mysteriously missing and this will have an impact on other characters that go out to search for them. I believe very shortly after some of the early updates, even maybe the first update, we will get a new map to explore. I think upwards of four new maps to explore over the entirety of the season that push us deeper into the Maguma jungle. I believe that we will get to go back to the Bloodstone eventually, though this may not be season two. I believe that could be season three that we finally get to see the Bloodstone. And I think there are very 
various things that this season will open up to us. It's going to be very much based around the Silvari. They established many core things in their personal story that now can be returned to. Number one is the idea of the Soundless. The Soundless are a faction of Silvari who did just what Scarlet did. They removed themselves from the Pale Tree. They didn't want to be connected with her or her influence and they're not Nightmare Core either. This is basically what Scarlet was, only she went the extra level and also went into Omad's machine um, and really provoked some dangerous stuff finding out what Morgimoth was. I believe the overall story will be that the Silvari are minions and are connected to Morgimoth, though our Silvari in particular will choose to not be a part of this and it will be about us finding a way around the predicament. I believe there's going to be a lot more story to do with the Nightmare Court coming up, particularly Foulane will come into the spotlight a lot more, as well as Kaith. Much of the story in Season 1 was hinting that Scarlet knew of a big secret that Kaith harbored. I believe that secret may be that Kaith has always known of Morgimoth and may have even came into contact with her. There's still some mystery of around the time when Foulane and Kaith parted ways or Foulane overruling and coming ahead of Cadian as the head of the Nightmare Court and I believe this is all steeply tied to Morgimoth. I do not believe that generic Nightmare Court characters know that they are working for Morgimoth or sort of aligned with him but I do believe that they are and I believe that eventually they're going to find Find that they have this big master and they've sort of been working for him. That the nightmare they've been trying to infect the dream with is just Morgimoth himself. I believe there will be some somehow an explicit mention that the big dragon you fight at the start of the Silvari tutorial area is a minion of Morgimoth and they may even set up as a Silvari character, when you when you begin character creation, you fight this dragon and everyone tells you, oh, this, this is your wild hunt, this is your dream, this is you have seen a dragon, you are destined to fight elder dragons. And I believe that they may sort of explicitly say, oh, it wasn't, your wild hunt is not complete, it was not kill Zaitan, Zaitan was not who you saw, it was Morgimoth. And then there will be all this extra motivation to go for there. I think they'll really start to set in stone all of these hints we've seen throughout the franchise for a long time now that's made people believe that the Silvaria somehow can connected to a jungle dragon of some kind and this is where it all begins. I will say this though, big prediction, I do not believe we will kill Morgimoth in Season 2. I believe the climactic finale of Season 2, this is what I'm going to end this video on, the big finale of Season 2 is us visiting and finding a second pale tree. It will be us finding the pale tree that Malik, you know, the, the perfectly neutral Savari, who was from another tree but completely disconnected from its influence because he was floating down a river. I believe we will find Malik's tree. And that is how season two of Living World will end. Season three will be a much bigger approach to confronting and eventually destroying Morgimoth himself. I don't think they're going to rush us into a huge Elder Dragon fight all in one go. It's going to be spread over two separate seasons. And that's about it. The video was going to be a much more in-detailed look. I was going to go over every single character, would you believe, um, that was introduced to us and whether I thought they were going to die or not. For example, Marjorie Delacroix was originally written to completely die at the end of Season 1, and then it all got leaked and they clearly changed the end of the story. What does that mean for Season 2? Does that mean Marjorie Delacroix is going to die again? Are they going to pull a 180 and have Kazmir die somehow? It's hard to speculate, but I did have a bunch of stuff about the characters. I guess we'll skip that since we're 40 minutes in, but I hope you guys enjoyed. Oh yeah! Yeah, I just got back from filming the footage. I guess I'll squeeze this in here somewhere. Another prediction. I do fully believe that on the world boss timer that ArenaNet have set up, they currently have a slot on there called TBD to be declared a new world boss that's coming in the game at some point. I believe that that is going to be a, a real world version of the boss you fight in the tutorial area as a Silvari that you should be able to see in the background footage right now. I believe that's what the TBD is going to be. A minor prediction, but one I'm so confident in, I'm going to slap it in here anyway. That should be a good assessment, hopefully for you, of everything that's happened last year, what we're going to be moving into this year, maybe the general idea and vibe of it gets you excited. We'll see how right or wrong I was. Um, many of my predictions last year were quite off base, to be honest, arena net through many different directions. For example, with the Thumper Turrets, I thought we were going to be going to Primordus, not Morgimoth. And I was kind of shocked when the devs finally told me, oh no, it is Morgimoth. So... We'll see. They could pull some 180s, but logically, I think this is where it's going. Hope you enjoyed, and I would love to hear your predictions. Where have I gone crazy wrong? What have I missed? What do you think about the consortium, for example? I didn't touch on them. Uh, anyway, big stuff to come, guys. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time.